text, which is actual reading, because their horizons have widened and they can handle it. Um, working on vocabulary and language comprehension all throughout this is crucial. And you can work on vocabulary and language comprehension without having children read. You can read to them and teach, and it's really important that we teach vocabulary and comprehension all along the way. We cannot wait until children can read words. And especially for children who have, who struggle with reading, we have to continue teaching them vocabulary, language comprehension, and lead them toward the skill of being good, deep readers, even if they can't, even if they're slow with the decoding piece. You just, you can't wait. And um, so, so if we want to have good comprehenders, we can't just stop at five. <coughs> we need also to teach them reading comprehension strategies and give them a lot of practice. More and more, we're learning as educators that, uh, that, that while we, it's fun to read stories to children and have them read fiction and novels, we really need to give them a very broad experience in reading, so they're reading uh, material from different subject areas. And one of the keys to developing good readers as children go beyond third grade is for reading instruction to occur in content area classes and subjects because the vocabulary in algebra is very different than the vocabulary in history and chemistry and so on and so forth. Um, so we're, um, we're all working hard to improve our ability to do that. And um, so we're looking for diagnostic instruction, direct instruction, explicit, sequential, multi-sensory, and for older students, analytical. So those are the those are the words you want to be looking for when you're evaluating programs. The there are some programs for multi-sensory uh, language instruction that we know follow research based or scientifically based principles. One of them is the Wilson Reading System, which we use here at Groves, and which I train uh, teachers to use, and it's varying programs. Linda Mood Bell has a phonemic awareness program, and they have a clinic here in the Twin Cities, more than one, I'm not sure how many, and they do that kind of instruction. Orton Gillingham is a, we have a very active Orton Gillingham Society of Minnesota. And they uh, train teachers and promote uh, <coughs> multi-sensory language instruction. And those are a set of principles that, are, uh, that teachers are trained in and then use, apply to uh, working with students. Uh, then there are some other ones that are less common around here. There's Slingerland and Herman and Alphabetic Phonics and there's a Barton Method and so on. And so there's a, a lot of programs based on Orton Gillingham um, that, are, that are good, reasonable programs. Yes. What is your opinion of the Sunday system? Uh, the Sunday system is an Orton Gillingham system and uh, uh, Arlene Sunday, I've been trained by her, Norton Gillingham, in the past, and she's wonderful. I think it's fine. Um, you know, I, I personally like the Wilson Reading System and Wilson Language Programs, mainly because they're an explicit, it's an explicit curriculum that goes from early, early foundational reading skills all the way to higher level concepts and you know etc. Um, it's a 12 step program actually uh, and it because it has a curriculum and it has it's devoted to professional development and training teachers they have very high standards and they have lots of materials and lots of support 
it, it, it works very well in a, uh, in a system, in a school, you know, because you know it provides a common language. The um, Orton-Gillingham uh, Orton -Gillingham systems are really uh, work best, I think, in a, in a tutorial situation probably, and they're great. I mean, the key to all of these programs is having a teacher who's well trained. You can have someone who says, oh, I teach the Wilson Reading System, and then ask them, what's your training? Have you been certified? Are you level one certified? You know, because if they're not, chances are they're not teaching the program with fidelity. And that's really important. So I would rather have a really passionate and persistent teacher and well-trained teacher in any one of these systems than I would a mediocre to kind of an untrained teacher in, you know, in the best system out there. You know, so it's really important that you, you know, when you're looking for instruction, that you're, you know, ask hard questions. Don't, you know, <clears throat> and if you're not sure what questions to ask, you can call me up and I'll give you a list. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because really, it's, it's, it's very crucial. And in fact, uh, Louisa Motes, who is one of the preeminent reading researchers, does a lot in the area of teacher training, and she uh, spoke, speaks passionately about the need for teachers to understand the, the what language is and, and how language is structured and so on. The teachers need to know that as a baseline. Then they can learn specific teaching techniques in order to instruct in that. And we are out of time. So, um, <clears throat> I, it's 8.30 and I never like to hold people. Do any of you have any particular questions for me at this point? Yes. Do you have that list of hard questions? Do I have that <laughs> list of hard questions? No, but I can generate it. Okay. You know, send me an email. Right. And I would be, yeah, definitely. I have a question. I don't know if I should wait until after because it might not be pertinent to everyone, but you have a child that's in an immersion program, mm -hmm. so was in a, in a French immersion program, mm -hmm. and now is just finishing first grade and is being diagnosed with dyslexia. Mm -hmm. So at, at that point, would it be better to pull out of a French program to focus only on the English and master that? Or is there any research or theory about? Well, you know, children in immersion programs without even the diagnosis of dyslexia are when, when are going to be slower to learn to read in a different system. Um, I don't know, you know, I mean, dyslexia affects any language, you know, and French is a hard language, English is a hard language. Um, I, I, would, I would tend to want to focus on learning English. Um, even, but you know, it's it's kind of a judgment call. And if you have an evaluator or a psychologist who did your evaluation, that's a great question for that psychologist. If it were me, I think I would try to, you know, I think I would probably try to find um, an environment where my child could get really explicit direct instruction in English the English language and to learn to read that since that's the language, you know, you live in the middle of a, you know, a big English speaking continent, I don't count Quebec, but, you know, so, but that's, I mean, that's, I'm just telling you, that's an opinion, I don't really know the right answer there. Charlie Rosa, one of his television programs was in, uh, interviewing an author and he was telling that he was uh, dyslexic and his child, he taught himself how to read and he thought he had outgrown it. Is that possible to outgrow it? Um, well, you know, there are people who, uh, who late in, I mean, we've had poets here and actually, um, actually Henry Winkler kind of had the same story. A lot of, you know, a lot of these people found out they were dyslexic when their children were diagnosed. And then they thought, oh, 
So sometimes people do pick up reading. Chances are they never become good spellers, maybe horrible spellers actually. Um, so I don't. You don't really outgrow dyslexia. Just to learn how to adjust here. You learn how to manage it. Mm -hmm. um, chance even people who are very well remediated often are slow readers. So this is where t really great text readers come in handy. So that the, for long assignments, you know, um, the the the, the text.